So welcome to Dickinson at a Distance, panel number two. Uh, I just want to say a quick word of thanks to the organizers uh, and especially all the labor that's been put in by people like Parikh and Adeline, who have been uh, so wonderfully uh, helpful uh, throughout all of this. Uh, so yes, uh, again, a quick reminder to please turn off microphones just to avoid the reverb effect. Uh, so, so yes, <laughs> please do turn off microphones. It will help our, uh, our panel to move smoothly. Uh, and I'll introduce people individually as we go along. And I'll just go, I hope this is okay, I'll just continue as, as I think previous panels have been going, just going in the order that they're listed in the program. That seems maybe the easiest way. And so I'll begin uh, by introducing Martha Nell Smith, uh, who is a professor of English, distinguished teacher scholar at the University of Maryland, where she is also the founding director of MYTH, the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities. She's of course written much important work on Dickinson uh, and is the executive director and coordinator of the Dickinson Electronic Archives. Some of her recent work in and around Dickinson uh, includes uh, the collaborative Emily Dickinson Translation Project with Bai Hua Long. Uh, she's working on Emily Dickinson, A User's Guide, which uh, is forthcoming in 2021. Um, she's also finishing a biography of Susan Dickinson an excerpt of which will appear in the Oxford Handbook of Emily Dickinson, which is forthcoming and edited by Karen Sanchez Epler and Christian Miller. And uh, she will be editing a second edition of MOA's Approaches to Teaching Emily Dickinson's Poetry. And so thanks to Martha Nell, and I'll turn it over to her. Okay, thank you very much, Ryan. I appreciate that introduction. And thank you to everyone for being here. I am going to dive in because uh, I know we're short on time. And Adeline, if you can share the second slide there after Dickinson and Be Beloveds while I'm talking. Um, over my desk, I keep an image of Susan Dickinson's notes remembering her beloved Emily. What the list is for, her biography of Emily, her obituary for, an introduction to the book of Emily Dickinson's writings she clearly described to Thomas Wentworth Higginson is not itself entirely clear. What is obvious is that this list is by someone with an intimate knowledge of Emily. Susan records, as you can see in the first line, Emily's love of flowers. That affection, was Emily's strength, that Dickinson loved to play a musical piece, The Devil, and that they, Emily and Susan, apparently and tantalizingly judged those with facts, but not the phosphorescence of knowledge. Not those items, but people who had the facts, but not the phosphorescence of knowledge. As I'm writing about Susan Dickinson and her decades long relationship with Emily, centered on matters of poetry, of philosophy, of being, of being a woman, and on matters of the heart, I often muse upon that list. In fact, every day I ponder her list. When I first started thinking about the focus of our meeting, Dickinson at a distance, I remembered what's written on the other side of that list. And so Adeline, if you could show that next slide. Yes. Um, from memory, Susan records a quotation from Walter Pater, a spring tide of intellectuality. There, she's likely referring to his writings about Heraclitus, superbly turning aside from the vulgar to think so early in the springtide of Greek history his reflecting on the aspects of what actually surrounds him, his crying out that his philosophy was no matter of formal treatise or system. But more importantly, if you look just below that, Susan records her memory of Emily's, or E's, distance tis till, distance tis till thyself, beloved. She's remembering Emily's letter poem to her, 
Distance is not the realm of fox, nor by relay of bird abated. Distance is until thyself, beloved. Now, Susan, Emily sends this to the woman to whom she wrote, Sweet Sue. There is no first or last in forever. It is center there all the time. To believe is enough and the right of supposing. Take back that bee and buttercup. I have no field for them. Though for the woman whom I prefer, here is festival. When my hands are cut, her fingers will be found inside. Distance is until thyself, beloved. Not distance is thyself, but until thyself. Declaring a commingling union, a suffusion. Susan wrote the first biographical sketch of Emily Dickinson, the obituary. Examining that carefully makes clear that poetry was sermon, hope, solace, life for Susan as well as Emily. What a difference it might have made had she been able to heed fully Emily's late plea written a few weeks before she died. Do you remember what whispered Horatio? And of course, Horatio was being asked to go and tell my story, Hamlet's story. In that short biography, Susan emphasizes Dickinson's astonishing way with words. Her talk and writing were like no one's, and also Dickinson's kindness, her selfish, con unselfish considerations. There are many houses among all classes into which her treasures of fruit and flowers and ambrosial dishes for the sick and well were constantly sent. Susan exhibits her own kindness, her own generosity, her own deep knowledge of priorities when two weeks later, she writes Higginson to thank him for bringing Dickinson's work before the curtain. Though she was stunned and undoubtedly hurt not to be the one first to bring a volume of Emily's writings into print, Susan was glad to see Emily's Damascus blades gain a wider audience. Thinking about this, and thinking about our congregation over these days as we contemplate Dickinson and distance. I contemplated my friend Mark Doty's recent book on Walt Whitman and his emphasis on the latter's declaration that time avails not, distance avails not, nothing too far away, nothing too long ago. Dickinson proclaims that he writes to come closer to, to be with Whitman. Isn't that what we who are haunted by Dickinson, who can't quit her, put her words down, also keenly desire? From the power of Dickinson's words, their relevance and resonances more than a century later, pardon me, and decades after her departure, we can be certain that time avails not, distance avails not. We're here dwelling in her house, a fairer house than prose. For what it's worth, there are a few of my thoughts on Dickinson, distance, and Susan and Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Martha Mill. That was beautiful. Our second oh, presenter is Amy Nestor. Amy is an independent scholar in Oakland, California, uh, focusing on poetics and 19th century American literature. Her current projects include a book, Material Silence, Dickinson, Melville, and the Poetics of the Inhuman, and an essay disclosed by Danger, Dickinson, Darwin, Inhuman, and Inhuman Time, 
which has been accepted to the proposed collection Conjuring Climate, reading Emily Dickinson at the End of the World. And so I will turn things over to Amy. No, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Amy, you need to unmute yourself and maybe restore the video. Uh, and video. Uh, if the quality is Can you hear me now? 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 Can you
outside the touch of futurity. Hence the densely complex imagery of the poem. Each that we lose takes part of us, a crescent still abides, which like the moon, some turbid night, is summoned by the tides. That beginning each, names are losses in their irreplaceable oneness and their multiplicity. Another friend, she had written, concatenating. Each losing bereft us, takes part of us. If we are made by our partaking of those we love, as they partake of us, each becoming part of the other, shaping imperceptibly, imperceptibly the other's way of seeing, of feeling, of knowing, of moving through the world. Thus, a crescent still abides. Loss sighs through ourselves. Shivers our bodies, our minds, our souls in the slightest shiverings of what we had known. A crescenting that, while it may endure, still, does so only stilly, riven from the promise of waxing, neither dead nor fully recognizably alive. Bereft of the relations that made us, we are not only bereft of our ways of knowing, of making sense, we are too bereft of the future. For futurity emerges from our worldly relations, from the endlessly unforeseeable openings their faces, their thoughts, their merest gestures bring. Loss upon loss has fallen differently upon each of us in these pandemic times. Some, of course, have lost loved ones to the virus itself. But the losses inflicted by death, but these personal losses, are not the only ones that have scythed through us. The 670,000 global deaths, concatenating, have shaped and changed the world. And their multiple rever reverberations have brought widening instability, uncertainty, have transformed, deformed all we knew, all we took for granted, all about our worlds. Although we may have found ways to steady our relations to those whom we love, and thus ourselves, in the gaps left between such quickly manufactured ways, time, with all its familiar rhythms, has slipped. Daily, weekly, monthly life seems at once radically contracted, leaving us with no time at all, and radically expanded, leaving us uncertain of the day, the week, the duration of our sheltering, and nebulous, its non-passage palpably wearing. We tell ourselves that the future will come, that these slivering times will end, but imagining that future becomes more and more impossible. The implacable proliferation of the virus and the brutal response of our government have left, have left us crescented with nothing certain but moreness, more death, more brutality, more loss. Yet the final lines of the poem offer an elsewise and elsewise to that, more, to that moreness, which like the moon, some turbid night is summoned by the ties. Strange reversals of gravitation of time. As Dickinson well knew, the force of the moon, it is the force of the moon that moves the tides, summons their movement. Yet in her line, with the moon obscured by skies made muddy, turbid, foul, impierceable, the tides, as if aching for the gravitational pull that has ever given them their coate, inchoate, watery mass form, summon the moon movingly. A summons that occurs with no established law that arises some turbid night, any night, indeterminately carrying the future. Dickinson's poem thus recalls us here now to attend to those tides, the ethical obligations they bear. And their summons has come, will come. It's when, it's whence, it's whom or what unknowable. Their call will not recover our lost parts, but in rendering us up to the mutual partaking with the world, it will reshape parts of us, of our knowing. Some turbid night, any night, indeterminately carrying the future. Thank you, Amy. I'm, I'm assuming that was the end right there. <laughs> Thank you, Amy, for that powerful meditation on the ethical obligations of memory. Our third presenter is Cynthia kreutz Ur, And Cynthia is the Associate Director of Education at the ARC San Francisco, a lifelong learning center for people with intellectual disabilities. She has an MA in Transpersonal Counseling Psychology from Naropa University, where she has also been an instructor. She has taught Dickinson to a variety of people, from preschoolers to people with Alzheimer's disease. And her presentation is entitled, Reading the Letter Never Written. So I'll turn it over to Cynthia. Cynthia, you need to unmute your mic. Hello. 
Hello. I'm having a, a moment's difficulty sharing my presentation. One second. Uh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. May I, may I share my screen? Yes, you can share your screen. I'm sorry, I'm still having difficulty. Maybe we should go on to someone else. Um, Cynthia, you, you, just, you just need to uh, open the file that you want to open and it should work. Maybe maybe we can try and um, move to the next speaker while Cynthia is looking for her file. Okay. Otherwise, I'm afraid we go over, over time. Yeah, I, I know we're. Please, thank you. Thank okay, you. thanks, Cynthia. Uh, okay, so as I believe uh, Adeline or Parak um, mentioned, Li Ching is not able to be with us today, and so we'll move on to Yanbing Kang. Uh, we have a pre-recorded presentation from uh, Professor Kong, and uh, Yanbin Kong is a professor of English at Jinan University. Her current project explores Dao in Emerson and related writers and is supported by the National Humanities and Social Science Foundation of China. She published essays in journals such as Style and the Emily Dickinson Journal. She also published two volumes of Chinese translations of selected poems and letters by Emily Dickinson. And uh, now I I'm, <laughs> I can or can you play it, Adeline? I have it open. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Does it work? Do you see it? It's looking, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to play the recording. Good morning, distinguished audience. My presentation is about Dickinson's non-service and Emerson. I will argue that Dickinson engages a creative conversation with Emerson's self-reliance, espouses withdrawing or withholding the giving, and regards non-service as an essential part of a perfect service. I will focus upon rereading Dickinson's It Came His Turn to Beg in relation to Emerson. To start with, 
Let us read some Emerson's quotations. Trust thyself, God here is with thee. The deity of man is to be self-sustained, to need no gift, no foreign force. Man is endogenous. The aid is mechanical compared to discoveries of nature. Lamentably, man does not put his genius in communication with the internal ocean, but goes abroad to back a cup of water. He rejects giving as usurpation. How dare you give them? We wish to be self-sustained. We do not quite forgive a giver. The hand that feeds us is in some danger of being bitten. For Emerson, a wise given is showing one's native riches. These Emerson's ideas resonate with Chinese philosophies, cultivating Dickinson's Eastern spirit. It came his turn to beg. The begging for the life is different from another alms. His penury in chief. I scanned his narrow realm. I gave him leave to live. Lest the gratitude revive the snake, though smuggled his reprieve. This poem has been subject to autobiographical readings. It is a rebuke to Kate Scott Anthem, who was searching for a person to love, or it recounts the interview between Dickinson and Charles Wordsworth. A perspective of Emerson can shed new light upon rejection, the reversal of power, and the speaker's attempt to avoid the gratitude, yet smuggling reprieve. In the first line, it came his turn to beg. The wheel of fortune is at work here. The beggar is desperate. Dickinson says, poverty of monarchy is an interior thing. Reverse cannot befall that fine prosperity whose sources are interior. So, penury in chief suggests spiritual poverty and the lack of self-trust. The second stanza, I scanned his narrow realm, directing the beggar's attention to his own realm. This gesture performs an Emersonian way of non-giving, showing one's native riches and encouraging inner inquiry, which is further reinforced by forceful rejection. I gave him leave to live, offers a preemptive strategy. It both means giving a permission to live and a request to leave. In less the gratitude revive the snake, the speaker alludes to the Aesop's fable, the farmer and the snake. Considering gratitude as harmful, Dickinson also rewrites Emerson's condemnation of the self-righteous giving. To avoid such a risk, the speaker needs to reject the beggar, requesting the beggar to leave. The beggar takes his leave, invigorated. Since the beggar does not get anything, he does not feel compelled to thank the speaker. Yet smuggle suggests that the beggar's reprieve is achieved surreptitiously or indirectly. The sending him away paradoxically constitutes an act of life giving. Thank you. So thank you to Yan Bin Kang for that uh, wonderful contribution to our panel. Uh, Cynthia, how, how do things look now? <laughs> um, I think I should be able to bring it up now, but I'm also happy to go last. That only seems fair. Uh, okay, whichever. Um, if, if you've got it right now, we can, okay. maybe we should just take advantage of it being right there <laughs> and, and dive right in. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And I apologize for the technical glitch. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Parikh. Thank you, Adeline. Um, I've been involved in a close reading of the Dickinson poem, Reading the Letter Never Written. So I'd like to, I'd like to begin by reading the poem out loud. This is my letter to the world that never wrote to me, the simple news that nature told with tender majesty. Her message is committed 
to hands I cannot see, for love of her sweet countrymen, judge tenderly of me. So one of the ideas I've been working with is um, I'm looking at uh, this is my letter to the world as a riddle poem. And I think using riddles is one way that Emily Dickinson gets around uh, Plato's uh, critique of written language. In, uh, in Phaedrus, Plato has Socrates say uh, that written language is not a good teacher because you can, you can ask the written word something and it will always say the same thing, unlike a live teacher. But I think with a riddle, different people can find different answers and can interact directly with the words and letters. So one of the ways I'm looking at this poem is as a fractal. So this is my neighbor's ferns and you can see the fractal shape of the fern. There's this long main branch and then there's other branches going off from that and other branches going off from that. So the shape is the same at each level of the fractal. So there's this triangular shape of the big fern, there's the triangular shape of the branches, there's the triangular shape of those branches off of that branch, and there's the triangular shape of the little, the final little leaflets. So in terms of this poem, the way I'm looking at it as a fractal is the fractal of the letter or litera in Latin. So the part contains the whole. So I'm looking at it as, at the level of the letter of the alphabet, letter as an epistle, letter as literature, letter as agent, one who lets. And this is a quote from the, um, from the Webster's lexicon that Emily Dickinson used. She called it her best friend. Letter from let, this is the first definition of letter. One who permits, one who retards or hinders, one who gives vent as a blood letter. When I first read this, I had to smile because the one in three who permits, hinders, and is a blood letter, that reminds me of some versions of the Trinitarian God. So letter is an agent, one who lets, and then God can also be represented by a single letter. And there are many, um, there are many alternatives. In Hebrew, God can be represented by a He, which is short for Hashem, the name. God could be represented by the letter I, short for I am, that I am. God could be re represented by the Greek chi, uh, which is the initial of Jesus, Christ. So this is an actual picture from, uh, from the Emily Dickinson archives of Emily Dickinson's own Bible. So of course, words are also composed of letters. I'm just gonna read part of this. This is from the first chapter, first verse of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So if we go back to the fractal, we, we come back to the, to the letter again. If words existed with God and before God, if words are God, and letters are the elements of words, then we're back to the level of letter. So I, I don't mean to be offensive to any traditionally religious person, but I think one of the things Emily Dickinson was doing was she was taking the tradition and standing it on her head. And I don't see this as being disrespectful to the Christian tradition. I see it as that she uh, was so fearless and she was so brave, no coward soul is mine, as Emily Bronte said, that she had such a great trust in faith and in truth and truth, after all, is one of the names of God, one of the attributes of God, that she was fearless in challenging the tradition. So my, my thesis is that she was trying to, to compact the maximal amount of power into the smallest verbal unit, which is the letter. And I think that she also wrote, experiment escorts us less. And I think she uses her poems as literal and uh, puns are intended as literal experiments. And she applies the spiritual principles, the most powerful principles she knew of her tradition to the poems to compress as the maximal amount of meaning into the smallest amount of space. So the Bible 
does mention letters. Uh, of course, Revelations, her, her favorite book of the Bible, uh, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. But another prominent principle in the New Testament is, so the last shall be first and the first last. And I appreciated Martha Nell Smith's quote, there is no first and last in forever. So I'm just going to give you one example of how this can work. So if we take the idea, if we take this principle and apply it to this particular poem, we can literally take the last letter of the alphabet, the E, and bring it up to the beginning and make it the first letter. So then we get this seemingly nonsensical word, ethos. But if we allow the elements to speak for themselves and to, to loose and bind themselves according to their according to their meanings, to allow them to loose and bind themselves in our minds here and now, we can get this, et, a small word, a very powerful word, a word in Latin, in French, in Hebrew. It can be pronounced either et or a. Uh, it means and, it means other things in Hebrew. And et, et, is the origin of our symbol ampersand. And ampersand in the, in the 19th century used to be considered a letter of the alphabet. So it would be the final letter of the alphabet. And this is a picture of Emily Dickinson's own New England primer showing ampersand at the, at the end. And this is one of Emily Dickinson's letters showing how she herself used the cursive ampersand And so my thesis is that Emily Dickinson was, was initiating um, a non-dual state of consciousness in us. So she was arguing with God. She was wrestling with God like Jacob. And she was saying the alpha, she took the alpha and omega image of revelations. And she was saying that is a powerful metaphor, God. But I, you needed two letters. You needed two letters of the alphabet to capture the beginning and the end, the wholeness of everything. I'm going to do it in one letter. And you did it in Greek, great. I'm going to do it in Latin, French, and Hebrew in one letter. So in the one letter, in the ampersand, she captures the beginning and the end in one symbol. The beginning, because it's pronounced A, so it's the first letter of the alphabet, the end because it's, it's the final letter in the alphabet in Emily Dickinson's own alphabet in her New England primer. And then I just want to end with this needlepoint sampler that my daughter found for me. This may have been Emily Dickinson's, it was probably her mother's, and it's a sampler of the letters of the alphabet that Emily would have stitched. And it's difficult to see, but here in the sampler, and this is in Houghton Library collection, is the letter A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. And so uh, I'll, I'll make the uh, executive decision that we, we won't have time for questions, but we definitely do want to hear from Dan, his, his full presentation. And so let me give a quick uh, introduction for Dan. Uh, Dan Feynman is a professor of American literature and literary theory at Occidental College. His work engages the intersection of the so-called American Renaissance and modern philosophy with an emphasis on Dickinson and Deleuze. His presentation will be on Dickinson's distance as dynamic disparity. So thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you for your patience and, uh, and get, letting us get to you. Uh, Ryan, may I, may I interrupt for a moment? This is Ellen Hart. Yes, yes. Yes, I would like to say that I would like this session not to be rushed that we have 90 minutes scheduled for the research circle and Leanne and I will check in and let people know, but I would like this session to be able to extend itself a little bit so that people can continue to enjoy the wonderful papers and also ask questions. So, so please take time. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. That's very Thank generous you, of you. And, and I, I appreciate that flexibility. 
given the technical challenges that were <laughs> inevitably are part of this process. So thank yes. you very much, Ellen. Yes, yes. Okay. I think we and so Dan, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and thank you as well. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, without an echo. It sounds fantastic. <laughs> oh, well, I rarely sound fantastic, so thank you. Uh, I sent in a five-minute video because I didn't think I could confine myself, uh, given my normal capacity to talk endlessly. You can either play the video or I can talk about this. I've been moving out of my uh, college office for the last two weeks, and I have nothing organized here, but I can still talk endlessly about Dickinson, I think, uh, probably well beyond the five minutes. So either you can play my video or I can talk uh, more or less freehand, whichever you choose. What Any you uh, incl yeah, inclination? I the video, so I, I can play it if you prefer. It's really up to you. Well, why don't you play it and then I'll just answer questions. I can't have any technical difficulties if it's all in your hands. Okay. I'm going to play Dan's video and share the screen. I'm Dan Feynman at Oxford College. Um, what I'm going to be trying to do today is give a tiny uh, subsection of what I believe is the central function of Emily Dickinson's aesthetic. Um, that is to say, to overcome uh, the banality and iteration of normative consciousness. Uh, what, I, what I think that Dickinson uh, presents to us is a world which is substituted, which is uh, really a changeling. Uh, the, the changeling is the modeling or the prosaic that we impress upon the world rather than perceiving the difference, vitality, um, and indeed ecstasy of the world as it's constantly happening, which is always new and never repeated. Um, this intervention is not uh, necessarily or certainly only into specific cliches or habituations associated with orthodoxy. Uh, rather, it is uh, an intervention also into those structures of thought which tend to be invisible because they are ubiquitous. Um, structures of thought which are so dominant, so presumed, um, that we don't think about them at all. Uh, one of these would be um, metrics of the real in general, uh, as represented by the metrical system uh, developed by the French and Talleyrand immediately following the French Revolution in 1790. Um, to, to briefly um, kind of etch that out, it, those are the belief that the world is subject to a metrical structure, which as Blake saw, overlays the world like a net in which it attempts to capture phenomena. And, and this capturing of phenomena is, makes the phenomena subject to disaggregation uh, and measurement itself. That is to say that a thing now is rendered not in its whole interactivity with other things, including the perceiver, but rather that the thing is presented as the model which the science and the data renders. This is a measure of, uh, in this case for this conference, distance, um, which is based upon a notion of a beginning and an end point, and is based upon a reductionism of usually only one variable, in this case, length, and that which is the constitutive kind of uh, central element in the real as opposed to thought, which is extension. Um, Dickinson, I think, tries to overturn this because I don't think that she actually believes in separation. So there can be no uh, difference as an extensivity between a beginning and an end point, which is a uh, necessary characteristic of the thing measured, but rather that she believes in intensivity. That is to say that um, what we need is to feel where we are, not to relegate what is the case of our encounter uh, and in all its multiplicity into a kind of diagram model or simply another. So I was going to do another poem, but let me read the one that I think is interesting to this result. If you were coming in the fall, I'd brush the sun by with half a smile and half a spurn as housewives do a fly. If I could see you in a year, I'd wind the months in balls and put them each in separate drawers for fear this would number fuse. 
If only centuries delay, I'd count them on my hand, subtracting till my fingers robbed from two Van Diemen's land. It's certain when this life was out, that yours and mine should be. I toss it yonder like a rhyme and take eternity. But now, in certain of the length of this that in between, it goes me like the goblin bee that will not stay the same. Um, that last line, I think, is the one that sort of summarizes what I'm attempting to um, Adam Bright in this brief compass. Um, that which is absent is present. Um, and what makes it present is the feeling we have uh, of its consequence. The notion of measurement is one that relegates phenomena, here one of love, longing, memory, uh, it transcribes it into a reductive model of one variable, which is distance, and hers is rather one uh, kind of measurement of felt intensity, like the goblin bee that will not state its sting, which is, one might know, a kind of sting worse than the sting itself, because the sting itself would then be a resolution of the apprehension, and hers is instead, in some sense, the promulgation the emphasis, the amplification of exactly that feeling of non-distance, but rather intensive as opposed to extensive feeling. Thank you for listening to the alternative me. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. That was wonderfully suggestive about Dickinsonian aesthetics. And so because of Ellen's kindness, we've been given a reprieve, at least a little bit of a reprieve <laughs> in terms of having maybe a little bit of time for conversation. And uh, so if there are a couple of questions or I can start by posing a question or I'll give people a, a, a few seconds here to think about whether they got a question they want to pose. I think Jeffrey has a question. Okay, wonderful, Jeffrey. Please. Thank you very much. Um, Martha Nell, thank you very much for your lovely thoughts and for the lovely delivery of your lovely thoughts. I, I, I've been trying to figure out that Horatio illusion that you, you referred to. I, I thought you, you tied it to, the, um, to Susan's writing of the obituary, but that, that little letter it, or note it goes, it says, I was just writing these very words to you, quote, Susan fronts on the Gulf Stream, unquote, when Vinnie entered with the sea. Dare I touch the coincidence? Do you remember what whispered to Horatio? Emily, so would you be able to say anything more about that little letter to clarify it? Because I'm mystified by it. I... I love this question, Jeffrey, and I have been mystified by this for a long time. I can't guarantee I have the answer, but uh, certainly at the end of Hamlet, what does Hamlet say to Horatio? He says, you know, in effect, go and tell my story. I, I apologize that I'm not reciting the Shakespearean English. It's really beautiful. And um, I think that Emily was asking Susan to go and tell her story. And if you read the obituary very carefully, um, it's a biographical sketch. It's very deep. She, I recited, to, or I pointed to two things about it, that Susan emphasizes Emily's writing and her acuity as a writer and a thinker. She also emphasizes her kindness, as I said. She also feels a need to address this, the myths that were already accruing around Emily, but she doesn't spend much time on those. She really focuses on Emily the person. So if that makes sense. Thank you. And thank you for the question, Jeffrey. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure, thank you. I see a question from Amanda Lowe. Amanda, do you do you want to pose your? Oh, there, there I see. <laughs> I hit share screen instead of unmute, like we need more technical confusion today. Um, 
thank you for your presentations. Those were all very lovely. Um, my, my question is sort of, I guess it's sort of for both Dan and for Martha. Um, I was really touched by the way that you were both describing sort of like lack of distance in Dickinson's poetry and the way she thinks interpersonally that, that two people or two phenomena can sort of be um, experientially smashed together to a certain extent or um, inextricably entangled. Um, but I was also struck when you were both talking about the many ways in which in her letters she is so terrified of distance. Of she, She's so afraid when friends go out of town that they're going to die. And I take her very literally um, when she says that, even in some of her poems, this idea that distance can create some kind of like great tragedy that can't be overcome. I'm just sort of wondering how um, either of you, what either of you think about that or what that, um, Dan in particular, I'm curious about what you think about how that relates to um, the way you're describing um, her experience of space as being about intensities rather than like measured distance. Thank you. Should I go? Well, um, I, I think that Dickinson is uh, basically a monist, uh, but not a Platinian monist. I, I rather believe that she's a monist of heterogenesis. This is to say that the world is of a piece, but it's constantly producing difference. Um, and that indeed the, the illusion of constancy or sameness is one which is generated by uh, letters or representation. So, um, uh, the notion someone mentioned earlier that the, out of like uh, Derrida's grammatology um, and Plato's objection to the grammatology, which is sort of weird since he believed in platonic forms, which were always the same. I, th I, th I think that Dickinson believes that the world is composed out of um, uh, dynamism, uh, out of differences. And so th there's a kind of, for me, what I've paradoxically called previously a p uh, kind of logic of loss in her that when she loses something, that's when it becomes apparent. And I think most of us um, feel the same thing subjectively, that the things in our house or in our immediate variety, we take for granted. Um, and so that oddly enough, something becomes apparent to us in its value by the very fact that it's nominally gone. And so that things appear more or are appreciated more or are felt more, or what I was calling intensivity, by the very effect that we have that we get over the habituations which are resident within the literal or the habitual. And so that I see all of her poetry as an intervention into the kind of nominal boredom that we create through the, the idea that, that something's five feet long and then it's five feet long again and it's five feet long again and it's five feet long. Well, this is the reset to map the thing into a kind of metric of self-similarity or even self-identity, which I think that she wants to violate. I don't know if that answers your question. I love that answer. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and, she, and one of the things you said in your question, you said she was terrified of losing people. And I think that uh, while I long ago learned, you know, that yes, in the 19th century, people wis witnessed other, their beloveds and others die in ways that we sometimes don't or often don't. In COVID time, I'm feeling that a lot more than I ever have before. You know, just Thursday night, a, a dear friend of ours died, um, not from COVID, and it wasn't a surprise, but the, the something Jeffrey, no, that Dan said about absence is presence. I, I just feel all of this more acutely, you know, and I don't know if this will be temporal, my feeling it more acutely, but I, I do. I don't know if that jumble made any sense. No, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, yeah. I have been thinking a lot about her, about Dickinson right now, because I feel like we're all forced into the kind of experience she, she sort of selected to have, where she was so isolated, you know, um, and it makes distances feel humongous now. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the answers. Since we're 
as I see it, a, a close to 17, 18 minutes over our given time. Maybe it's a natural moment to close. I've got several questions that I could pose to these wonderfully suggestive uh, panelists. And so thank you once again to all the panelists. Thank you to Ellen again for granting us a little bit of extra time for the panelists. And uh, thank you uh, to Adeline and Parik as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. My best. Wonderful.